Welcome everyone, um, my name is Pat Bailey, I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at LSBU and I want to offer an incredibly warm welcome to you. This event, this Enterprise Lecture, is a fantastic opportunity for us as a university. I think it's a wonderful initiative and it aligns brilliantly with two things that we are incredibly proud of. Um, the first is that we have the Clarence Centre, the Enterprise Centre of the University. The other thing that we're incredibly proud of are the way that our students are engaged more generally in enterprise. Actually, you see that in a, in a slightly peripheral way because we have 4,500 students, the largest number of any university outside the OU, I believe, <laughs> who are employer-sponsored. In other words, the engagement we have with industry is absolutely at the heart of the degrees that we offer and absolutely at the heart of the mission of London South Bank University. So you can see that today's event is absolutely perfectly aligned with the mission that we've got. There are four people that I want to, to say a, a welcome to. Um, the first two are... Um, uh, the Right Honourable Keith Vaz, MP, you see at the far side over there, who's going to give the presentation. <laughs> and to Dr Rami Ranger, CBE, sitting also at the front there. The third person, very proud to be included in such elite company, is going to be your Master of Ceremonies for the uh, rest of the activities, uh, which is J Gups Jag Powell. So Gups is going to be looking after the presentations that we have and very importantly the question and answer session which is going to follow the two presentations that we'll hear. Um, but the third welcome is absolutely to all of you. It is a fantastic group of people who've come here today, those who are involved in enterprise and business, a huge welcome to you, to students and staff members from LSBU and quite a few alumni, people who have been here part of the uh, university here and then gone on and done great things themselves. So this is a huge thank you to all of you and although the centrepieces are going to be the two presentations that we're going to hear, um, actually your involvement um, in this event is absolutely at the heart of making it a success. So I hope you enjoy it, really take part in it and I'm now going to hand over to Guts to lead on the rest of the event. Thank you, Pat. So, just as, as with Pat, just to add my welcome to you all here today. Um, yes, my name is Gurpreet Jagpal, but most people only call me Gurpreet if I'm in trouble. So please, just, just use gups, uh, otherwise I'll think I've done something wrong. Um, so to just give you an idea and a flavour of, of what we're trying to do today, um, the whole kind of purpose of the event is an inaugural lecture series around kind of entrepreneurship, small business, and also a celebration event. So many of you in the room will know that we were kind enough to receive a donation from Rami towards the tail end of 2014. And today is a celebration of what we've already done with some of that, uh, that funding and to tell you a little bit more about what we've got planned for the future. 2014, LSBU was very fortunate to receive a £250,000 donation from Rami. And essentially it was about inspiring and supporting enterprise excellence at London South Bank University. You'll see from this small booklet that I hope most of you have picked up from the reception and the registration desk, that highlights a lot of what we've done with this resource. And I'm just going to run through some snippets of that. All of everything that you see in that publication, this wouldn't have been possible without the support from Rami. So we're hugely, hugely grateful for the support that we've had. So one of the first things that we've done is to hire some entrepreneurs in residence. And here they are, five. And some of these individuals are in the audience, Neil I can see, um, and Peter Harrington right at the back. And these are individuals that are here to support students and graduates who are trying to start and grow businesses. Without Rami's support, we wouldn't have been able to hire these people in. They spend a day a week, half a day a week, in London South Bank University, talking with our students and graduates, <coughs> mentoring, coaching, providing advice, and helping them to really grow and develop their businesses. And they come from a range of sectors. We've got IT, creativity, social entrepreneurship, reflecting the demographic of the kinds of businesses that we're starting here as a university, or our students are starting. The second bit of support, and Pat briefly mentioned this, was the Centre for Graduate Entrepreneurship. 
and this is where we had the, the launch event of when, uh, for, for Ami's kind donation. And that's a picture of the building on a nice summer's day in London, which is almost every day. Um, and in, within that space, we have a graduate incubator. And that space is purpose-built for LSBU graduates who have finished university and have decided to embark on a journey to actually start and grow a business over the course of a year, trying to really make a success of it and launch it as a full enterprise and going, in, going into it as their, as their career. Why is that important? Office space, as you can imagine, in London is, is not only hard to come by, but very expensive. So the fact that we can offer space for well over a year to our graduates and we can support up to about 12 businesses in the space is immensely useful and hugely, hugely beneficial to our graduate entrepreneurs. Some of which, wave your hands, Ben, Rotson, Stephen are in the audience today. And all of these have benefited from the Graduate Entrepreneurship Centre. The third area is the annual lecture, the first of which you're here to <coughs> participate in today. And this is really about inspiring individuals, joining us from industry, from <coughs> government, from social enterprise, from the public sector, to share with us the latest trends around small business, entrepreneurship, so that our staff and our students, and actually students from local schools can come in and hear more about what is happening in the world of entrepreneurship and small business. Really important when you're looking at future careers and uh, job opportunities of where it is that you want to go as an individual. And then there's future projects. That's what we've managed to get off the ground. And the next two areas that we're going to be really focusing on this year is the Investment Fund and the Enterprise Fellowships. The Investment Fund, we will see us actually launching a pot of £100,000 that will be available to student and graduate entrepreneurs as a loan. So as you would go into a kind of a bank or a VC investor, you can come into the Rami Ranger Investment Fund and pitch for some funding. Really important in the crucial early stages of business startup and growth and development, access to capital is, is, is really, really difficult for those starting out. So what we've done, we're trying to mitigate that by you setting up our own investment fund. And then our enterprise fellowships. Each year we'll select one graduate and one student entrepreneur and provide a fellowship of between five and £10,000 to help them to grow and start their business. So there you have it. This is the Dr. Rami Ranger Excellence Fund. And you can see that we've set on quite an ambitious journey. And I'm extremely proud of the donation that Dr. Rami Ranger has provided. My team, London South Bank University, and I think most importantly, the people that are the recipients of the services, the products, the incubation space, the funding, the fellowships, are extremely, extremely grateful for the support you've provided. So thank you very much for that. Round of applause, please. So I've told you a lot about what we're doing with the fund, but I think it's also um, would be a little bit unfair to tell you all about the fund, but not anything about the man that has provided and has been so generous in giving us his support. And so um, from nothing to everything, and I, I was fortunate enough to go and see Rami uh, in, I think it was August last year, and he shared his book, uh, a copy of which I've got here, but this is my personal signed copy, so it won't be going anywhere. But it's available in all good bookstores and as an ebook as well. Um, and I would strongly encourage you to, to, to download it, to buy it, and have a read. It's a truly, truly inspirational journey. So I took it with me uh, on the plane to, to, to the US, uh, and it was a, a most insightful read. And it's such an inspirational journey that I can't do it justice in the next kind of five minutes that I'm going to speak to you about it. So please, please do, do go out and purchase and read it. And From Nothing to Everything is an inspiring saga of struggle and success from two pounds to a 200 million pound business. And like I say, just a few minutes to share some highlights. This, I believe, is the family home in Gujranwala, where Dr. Ranger was born. And also the place where he spent the first few weeks of his life back in 1947. The house is still there. And the house is still there. Still there Excellent. Still there. And for those of you that may not know, but 1947 was quite a turbulent year for India and Pakistan. It was the year that India and Pakistan was partitioned, and we saw one of the largest mass migrations of people between the two countries. And Dr. Rami was one of those 
that made that awful journey across from Pakistan to India, where we saw hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people killed. Ramiji survived, and you were made that journey two months with, with his mother and seven of his siblings. And unfortunately, before Rami's birth, his father actually passed away. No, assassinated. Assassinated as part of a mob that didn't believe in his views of a non-partitioned India and Pakistan. United India, free of rivalry. Yeah. So, very difficult start to his life. And I know from my own conversations with Rami, my parents and my grandparents, that that year, 1947, 1948, and the years subsequently, were quite difficult years. So as he made that journey, he got across to India, and I know Rami, as being the youngest, as I am too, the youngest in Indian families, Indian households, we always get spoiled. His mother made sure he got an education, although I think he will freely admit Rami really wasn't interested in education, more interested in playing than studying. Having skipped a couple of years of school, he still managed to secure a pre-degree year at Mahindra College, tried to join the army, like his siblings, was rejected twice, but I think you said, and I quote you from the book, that was the best thing that ever happened to you, to not have actually got into the army. He then moved to a favourite city of mine in India, Chandigarh, where he studied a BA degree in history, political science and English. With no real clear idea of what he wanted to do in life. So when you don't know what you want to do in life, what do you do? You, you pack a suitcase and you come to England. <laughs> and on 22nd of May 1971, he arrived. But I think he would admit it was a culture shock. Absolutely. He'd arrived to do a law degree, but he couldn't just afford just to do the law degree. He needed some income to subsidize his living costs. He was living with his brother and wife uh, at the time, sleeping on a living room floor uh, in a sleeping bag. He'd try and get out before they got up, so he wasn't an inconvenience to them. And he'd slip in late at night when they were already in bed. And it was a, a trial and tribulations of most Indian families, I think, during, during, that, uh, during that era. So, struggled to get a job, but his first job was cleaning cars. Not that car. Um, but he spent a lot of time commuting to and from work. He could either walk to work or he could take a bus and then a train and then get to the office. So, quite, quite difficult. So, from cleaning cars, he saw an advert to be a chef. And in, in those days, KFCs, you were, you were actually a chef. Um, so he saw the advert, went for the job, trained as a chef, and was paid, listen to this, 35 pence per hour. 35 pence per hour. And he worked every hour he could for 35 pence an hour. Just bear that in mind. He earned a lot of respect with KFC. And a year after starting, within a year, he became a store manager. 18 months after that, a district manager overseeing 10 stores and a company car. I had no idea KFC did company cars. <laughs> That's just amazing. Learned a lot about business at KFC, but was made redundant in 1976. And decided to do what most Indian businessmen do, corner shops. And I think you ended up having three corner shops. And this isn't the corner shop picture, because I couldn't find one <laughs> in, in your book. But the first corner shop was in Sidcup with a sub post office attached to it. And your first three businesses were also corner shops. And you learnt a lot from those. But then a big mistake. Decided, after speaking to his brother, to move to Canada. And I think you had to move quite quickly. So sold the shop, raised as much cash as he could, boarded a plane with the family, and headed over to Canada. But within a year, was back in England. It didn't work out. Ended up coming back, buying another shop. Not enough income coming from the shop, so he leased the shop and got a job working in curries. And he decided to work in curries because he had no idea about electrical goods. And actually, if you go into curries now, most people don't have an idea about electrical goods. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst working at curries, didn't feel that he was recognised, was undervalued, and needed a way out. And that's where most entrepreneurs will start their journey. Undervalued, not feeling that they're getting recognised for the work they're doing, and like that autonomy and think they can do a much better job themselves. And I'm fast forwarding a few years now, and this um, takes us to 1987 in August, when he started sea, air and land forwarding. With £40, ladies and gentlemen, 
and two pound in capital. 40 pound and two pound in capital. He built up a very good reputation with his customers for exporting goods, um, whether it was his customer service, whether it was the way that he packaged his goods, but he was essentially delivering electrical goods for customers all over the world, Nigeria, <coughs> the US, and his service set him apart from others. As a result of that, he was getting lots of recommendations. And he spotted a niche to move into other goods, food and drink, for example. And he ended up shipping for the likes of Cadbury's, McVitie's, Mars, and others, household names to you and I. But one thing he couldn't do was sell. He could take Cadbury's products, ship them, but someone else then sold them. And they were reaping even more rewards for selling. So what do you do? You decide that you're going to manufacture the goods yourselves. And instead of manufacturing Cadbury's or McVitie's, he developed his own brand of goods, Royal Foods being one example, and was recognizing the fact that some of the local people couldn't afford the branded goods, but wanted similar taste, similar quality goods. And as a result, what we have now is Sunmark Foods, which is not only uh, part of the CL land forwarding distribution, but also manufactures hundreds of products for selling around the globe. So what we now have is a man that has taken two pounds, turned it into a 200 million pound business, and is an unprecedented holder for the Queen's Award for Enterprise for well over five years in a row. Please, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Dr. Rami Ranger. Brings back memories, and I'm really grateful for all the effort, hard work you have put in in this presentation. It is really remarkable. Well, I'm here to share the journey, so there we go. So, Mr. Pat Bailey, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of this great university, the Right Honorable Keith Vaz, MP, Chairman of the Home Office Select Committee, Mr. Gurpreet Jagpal, you heard him just now, Director of the Research Enterprise, dis distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and I have among you some of the people I look up to people like Mr. C.V. Patel, Mr. Krishna Rale. I'm indebted to London South Bank University for allowing me to share my life journey with others who may be in similar situation as I once was. We both feel by sharing stories such as mine, we can encourage others to face challenges which fate throws at us from time to time. I'm grateful to Keith for sparing his valuable time to deliver this inaugural lecture today. I requested Keith because he has smashed many glass ceilings in Britain and has inspired many like me to go the extra mile. He was the first Asian to be elected to Parliament after many, many decades. Thanks to Keith, Parliament has begun to reflect the modern day Britain of today. Keith, you have made British democracy stronger by encouraging the participation of Britain's diverse population. We really thank you. I'm also thankful to Professor uh, David Phoenix. He's not here, he had to rush away somewhere. He's the Vice Chancellor for, for encouraging diversity to flourish in his campus. When I first walked in, I felt I was in the United Nations building with so many nationalities studying together in perfect harmony. And that's the way we should be wherever we are. Nothing would have been possible without the commitment and hard work of Gurpreet, who has been instrumental in arranging this lecture today. And you heard, you saw the effort, the <coughs> commitment <coughs> behind his work. Thank you, Gurp, for taking Dr. Rami Ranger CB Center for Graduate Entrepreneurship a step further. I'm also grateful to all of you, the guests, for making this more memorable day for me with your presence. CB Saab, we are really grateful that you, I know you how busy you are, and you have been a role model and inspiration for me, and also people like Keith, I may say so. Yes, Krishnanji, thank you for coming. <coughs> and I have Linda Topping from Watford. We have Huma Fakka from Pakistan, who's come all the way. We have Sonia Soyota, who's come all the way from 
Whitehall. We have <laughs> Dr. Damamuli. She has come from Birmingham. And of course, we cannot forget the media who are here. I call Pitaji Dhruv Garvi. He is the <coughs> face of ZTV. We have Sunrise Radio with Emma and Tony here. And we also have Aziz from Asian Light somewhere. Thank yes. You. So all you guys are very important because you make the activities known to other members of our community. And uh, so the, our story just doesn't finish here. It keeps going forward and forward. Ladies and gentlemen, like many others, I too faced many challenges, but I remember my late mother's word. Efforts are in, the, in our hands, and the rewards are in the hand of God. We must do our best and leave the rest to Almighty. I did just that, and the rest is history. I've also demonstrated that one does not need a rich father, family wealth, or elite education to be successful in life. Unfortunately, I did not have a father, let alone a rich one. My father was assassinated two months before my birth for opposing the breakup of India on the basis of religion. He wanted India free of rivalry, like we all have now. Nor did I have an elite education, as I started my journey from a refugee camp in India, or family wealth, because we lost everything uh, during the partition, to help me in life. All I had were the teaching of my late mother and the British sense of tolerance and fair play. As a result, an ordinary immigrant like me could realize his ambition and become an asset for his family and his adopted country. I believe what one needs to succeed in life are certain quality, and luckily, we are all born with them. They are self-respect, work ethics, commitment, vision, and empathy. We need self-respect, as without it, we would cut corner and would not hesitate in letting our customer suppliers down with dire consequences to our business and reputation. Work ethic is very important. Our motto is, we only succeed when our customers succeed. We work hard for their success, which in turn becomes our success. Empty for others is important, as no company can grow if the customers are suffering because of a I'm all right, Jack approach. If we treat our customer right, then we can build a reputation which is essential to grow our businesses. Number four, it is important to have vision, as without one, if without it, we are headless chicken, unable to find our direction. Number five, we need total commitment to work, as there is no substitute to work. I started my logistic company, as you heard, in 1987, just capital of two pound and 40 pound typewriter from a rented shed in Hayes. The marketing company was launched in 1995 and is now exporting Brit British product to 120 countries with staggering results. Our com company is the only company to have won the Queen's Award for Enterprise in International Trade for an unprecedented five consecutive years. No other company has this accolade in Britain. Our turnover is now approaching 200 million pound and is growing over 15% per annum. Our company has been added to Sunday Times profit track, 100 being the most profitable countries for the last three years. I also became the Institute of director, Directors, the Directors of the Year in 2030. It was shocking, shocking for me to be selected as a director among all 600 illustrious directors of big and you know, me mega companies. This year, Her Majesty was grac graciously pleased to upgrade my MBE to CBE for connecting Britain to 120 countries through trade and promoting community cohesion, which is very, very important because we now have one country and queen. As a result, we have become one. So we must now promote tolerance, peace, and harmony so that our next generation can enjoy this beautiful country even more. I could never have imagined a day when I would witness a lecture after my own name being delivered by one of the icons of the Asian and British community, Mr. Vaz. And that too in London University in front of an August gathering. This is a dream come true for me and it's all very humbling experience for a man who once had nothing 
and now have everything and more. Thank you very much. Now, I now have a pleasant duty to invite the keynote speaker for today, the Right Honourable Keith Wes MP. Although Keith, we Keith does not need any introduction, but I'm going to give him some anyway. <laughs> Keith has been considered the most powerful Asian in Britain for year after year after year. He is the chairman of the powerful Home Office Select Committee. Because it's very important to have role model in a country so that other people can feel that it is possible to you know, progress in this great country. So we share our story to say that you, being like Keith, can go into political arena. Keith, we are very proud of you. You have done tremendous work. You made many Bollywood film star doctors. <laughs> yes, starting from Shah Rukh Khan to Amitabh Bachchan, and you raised a lot of money for diabetic concern, Silver Star, which is a fantastic. You have given a lot of uh, vans equipped with diabetic testing equipment to many poorer countries. So we, what can I say? I can be here all day talking about <laughs> Keith Wells. So thank you very much, Keith, for being the man you are and being my friend above all. Thank you. Uh, Rami, it is a huge honour and privilege to be with you here today to be participating in a historic occasion, the first Rami Ranger Enterprise Lecture, uh, especially coming from someone who's never on a business. This is quite an achievement to have chosen me for this particular uh, occasion. I was kind enough to say that uh, uh, I was someone he uh, uh, that inspired him, but I'm afraid he's got it completely the wrong way round. It is people like Rami who day in, day out, aspire those of us in Parliament by the enormous work that they do, by the enterprise that they have shown, and by their commitment to society. I don't claim to have created any jobs in the 29 years I've been in Parliament or changed many lives, but I know that he has. And I think the fact that you have called this lecture after him and that he has been uh, named to uh, be the uh, name uh, on the letter paper and the, uh, the building as far as this uh, Enterprise Centre is concerned is a huge um, honour for him, but also for the wider Asian community. So Rami Ranger deserves our thanks. Round of applause for Rami. Now you've asked me to talk about uh, Enterprise. Uh, to people who are probably studying enterprise, or those like Rami Ranger and others, C.B. Patel, Tony Litt, uh, Shafali Solanki, who deal with enterprise every single day. So I feel a bit like a fraud, because as I've said, I've, I've not really created any single job in my life. But I have watched great uh, entrepreneurs, and I have studied a little bit of what they've done. And this is my take on what it means to be uh, an entrepreneur and how we can encourage more and more people to be involved in this uh, process. Uh, the English Dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, describes enterprise in a rather mundane way as a project or undertaking. Uh, now that doesn't sound very exciting, but the Rami Ranger Enterprise Centre and those of you who want to be entrepreneurs will all want to be bold and you will all want to be uh, doing exciting things because there is no point in being involved in enterprise unless you try and break that glass ceiling. So those of you who are studying this subject, and I am not one of those who believe absolutely that if you get an MBA at Stanford or indeed an MBA at South Bank University, you suddenly become uh, the richest man or woman in the world. I'm from the old school who believes very firmly that enterprise comes from within you. You can watch people, you can learn from their example, but at the end of the day, it is your personal commitment, something that Rami has just talked about, which I think matters more than anything else. It's worth looking at some of the figures about startups uh, in the United Kingdom. In 2015, 500 
and 81,000 new companies were created in our country. This year, it's expected, if the projections are right, that that figure will go over 600,000. Now, if you look at the annual startup in 2011, <coughs> the annual startup has increased from 440,600. So there are obviously people out there who believe that working for big companies, though it's wonderful to work for a brand, frankly, does not meet their expectations because of the large number of increases. And if you look at um, the, the big cities of the United Kingdom, in Greater London in 2015, there were 184,671 new enterprises. In Birmingham, it was, it was 18,000. In Manchester, 13,000. In Glasgow, 8,000. And in my home city of Leicester, 6,000. So with each one of those people who have decided that they want to create wealth rather than to be part of a wider enterprise, it shows that that entrepreneurial spirit is very much with us. And I think that that bodes well for the future of entrepreneurship. As Rami's life has uh, demonstrated to us, um, you can start with very little, but also you can end up with a great deal. But inevitably, we focus on the success stories. Rami and I both know um, the founder of the Leela uh, chain of hotels, um, someone called Captain Nair, who fought in the um, resistance, as I like to call it, against the British rule. Um, and he was a very successful entrepreneur. He used to make a lot of lace in the textile industry in India. And at the age of 65, he went to a hotel and he felt he was not particularly well treated. And therefore, he decided um, that he was going to set up his own hotel chain, rather like Victor Kayam, you remember the adverts, who didn't like the razor uh, that he was using, and then decided to buy the company and um, uh, name the company after himself. I'm not sure whether Rami is proposing to buy curries one day uh, when he next uh, uh, has an opportunity. But you need that one spark uh, which is going to make you feel I want to do something that's going to be either my legacy or that's contributing, is going to contribute um, to the country that I'm in. So at the age of 65, he decided to set up a hotel chain, which is regarded as one of the great luxury <laughs> hotel chains in uh, the world. And he died when he was 90 years of age. So I think age is not a barrier to what you're doing. So although, of course, I'm addressing an audience that is fairly young, uh, there are some of us who might just feel that we are uh, at the right stage to try and form and found a great company. CB is an excellent example. Um, I won't disclose your age, CB, to the audience, but this is a man who is constantly brimming with ideas <coughs> and that a week does not go past without me getting a telephone call from him to say, actually, I've thought of this idea. Can I meet with you? Can we take it forward? And I think that that is a very important part, that spark of life that allows a leader to be able to say, I want to create something and I want to do something different. And I'm going to go back to what entrepreneurship is about. I think leadership is absolutely critical. Um, people saying yes or no, even if they're wrong, we don't mind leaders being wrong so long as they do the one thing that we expect all leaders to do, apologise, many times frequently apologise. They need the ability, I think, to be honest. You have to honestly say when you think you hold a, a view uh, and when you hold a view that's different. I had a marvellous uh, discussion with my two kids on Sunday when I went to see them at university about the American elections, having gone through the Labour leadership elections with everyone in the household supporting a different candidate. <coughs> and it was great to hear my 18-year-old daughter tell me that she thought that Bernie Sanders was the candidate of her choice and he should be president of the United States. Uh, of course, shaming me when she supported the winner in the Labour leadership campaign, voting for Jeremy Corbyn when I voted for Yvette Cooper. She was on the winning side. So honesty, being bold, being able to say yes or no, I've got it wrong, this is the way I want to go, I think that's really important. I think a good leader and a good entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur has and should have the ability to delegate. I've recently finished an excellent book 
um, about uh, the leadership skills of the greatest uh, football manager uh, in the world, Alex Ferguson, who started working in the governed shipyards and ended up being the manager of Manchester United and becoming the most successful manager anywhere in the world. And it's surprising um, how much, when you read this book, is all about uh, people who delegate. Um, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a Stalinist. I need to know everything about what's happening in my office. I want people to tell me everything that they're doing. I may not answer their texts, but I want to know everything. This morning, it may be surprising to you, considering I'm delivering this lecture, but I'm also off to talk about Yemen, uh, and then I've got uh, uh, other meetings about the migration crisis and preparing for a select, meeting, a select committee meeting next week on immigration detention. But my first meeting of this week um, was because I sit on the administration committee of the House of Commons, and I was very worried about the colour of plastic bags that they were putting our products in. <laughs> and I said, you can't have a plastic bag that is black and gold. You had to have a plastic bag that was green and gold because the colour of the House of Commons is green. And you have to have the portcullis right in the middle of the plastic bag, not at the side. I said, we're not Dolce and Gabbana. Um, uh, you know, people come to the Commons shop uh, because they want to buy a bag that says House of Commons on it. Um, 35p, but that's what they actually want to have their products in. So that kind of detail, you might think, this man is completely mad. What was he doing at this meeting? But it bothers me because I have a lot of constituents who come here and that little detail matters. So I'm not saying don't bother about the detail. The detail matters sometimes, but actually you do have to have the ability to delegate. Um, CB is a good delegator. Rami is a good delegator to Sonny over there when I want anything from Sunmark, he's the one, and he trusts him. You have to trust people who work for you. You also have to be able to communicate well, uh, and communication is a key. The ability to speak very simply in short sentences is very important. Um, my son has an interview today uh, for an internship. Uh, he won't take any advice from me, of course. Kids never do. I'm going to pass a law saying that when parents text their children, they need to text back. Very, very important, because we pay the fees, so we need to know what you're doing. Um, but communicating is very important, and the one thing I said to him is, in my last text, was, you know, people need to be able to speak clearly, and they need to be able to communicate. Cameron's success as Prime Minister and at the dispatch box is because he is able to communicate very well. Of course, he went to the best school in the world, and the second best university in the world, Oxford. Um, so uh, he is able to do that communication rather like Blair did, rather like Thatcher did, because getting over that message is critical. Uh, and you can tell at an interview, if you wrap it on at length, you're not going to get the job. Um, so communication is very much. Confidence is absolutely vital. You have to have that confidence of being able to stand up and say what you believe and say what you think. And if you have that confidence in yourself more than in anyone else, uh, then that makes a great, difficult, de great difference. There's also creativity, intuition, inspiration that we've heard, enough, uh, heard about, uh, very, very important. Ferguson in his book talks about winning the game. Winning a game is only a short-term gain. Building a club brings stability and consistency. I'm one of those who believes in the long term. I do not believe in short-term gain. The Japanese invented the card, okay? I know we think we did, but we didn't. Um, they invented the calling card. And how many of us, when we get our calling cards, actually bother to communicate or write to or send an email to the person who has contacted us? Absolutely vital. You never know in entrepreneurship and in life when a person is going to be useful to you in the future or going to help you grow your business. The most important aspect I can't talk about because I'm very bad with money, uh, as you probably expect, as someone who will never run the country. I'm never going to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. But finance is absolutely critical. What I like so much uh, um, about what your plans are 
is the ability to be able to give out finance to people to let them grow their ideas. Um, I'm afraid the classic example of the two pounds in your pocket or the uh, five quid in your pocket when you arrive in this country, it doesn't work anymore. It was of an age where you could do that because you had everything else. But actually, you do need access to finance. And the banking system that we have does not provide that. Go to a bank manager, and the bank manager is almost always going to say no. If you don't have a house, and you don't have a guarantor, and you don't have a mentor, and you don't have the money, they're not going to lend money, especially in the current economic climate. So it's going to be very, very difficult if you don't achieve that. And I don't think, to be honest, that being uh, an immigrant uh, is a problem. Um, Michael Moritz, uh, who is the man who created Sequera Capital, uh, a company that provides finance uh, to other companies, as a result of what they have done, um, they have managed to fund companies that are worth $1.5 trillion. There's a nice little quote in this book about those who came to America as first-generation immigrants. We hear of the Rami Rangers, and we hear of Silicon Valley, but it's very interesting how many people arrived in America and achieved so much because they were immigrants. And I want to end by reading you this very small passage from his book. Silicon Valley teams with examples of these types of people. Jerry Yang, the co-founder of Yahoo is one. His father died when he was a toddler and Jerry arrived in the United States from Taiwan with his mother and younger brother at the age of 10, unable to understand English. Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google and Yan Kum, the co-founder of WhatsApp, share some of the same lineage as Jerry, though they arrived from the East. Sergei and his family fled religious persecution in the Soviet Union, as did Jan and his mother when they left Ukraine in 1992. There was much poignancy to the symbolism associated with the spot where, in 2014, Jan signed the papers to sell his company to Facebook for $19 billion. It was outside the former welfare officer in Mountain View where he and his mother had queued to collect their weekly food stamps. I'm not saying that childhood deprivation is a prerequisite for entrepreneurial success, but the children of middle-class parents, Microsoft's Bill, Bill Gates, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg, and Snapchat's even Spiegel are amongst the minority of, tech, of successful technical entrepreneurs. What the book talks about is the self-made person. So you don't have to be the son or daughter of Keith Vaz or Rami Ranger in order to achieve entrepreneurial success. It is within you. It is there for you to write that page with your own signature. And that's what makes, I think, our country so special and so different. That's what brought Rami Ranger back from his year in Canada, not because it was so cold in Toronto, but because he felt he could achieve so much more in this country. And I've heard him so many times talk about Britain and the opportunities that Britain have to offer. So I am privileged and delighted to have been able to have delivered this lecture. I hope that from amongst you, we will find people who will be able to go on and do not only great things, the likes of Rami and Shafali and CB and Krishna, but things that are even beyond that. So we can have our own Zuckerbergs and our own Spiegels from this audience and from South Bank. Thank you very much for listening. So anybody with a question? Well, I just wondered whether the entrepreneurial spirit ran through all your family or whether it was... Not at all. Not at all. You see, none of my family ever been in business. My grandfather was a doctor in Rawalpindi. My father was a, a lawyer, advocate. He was a public prosecuting inspector for the British. Uh, and then uh, he left because of the 
differences he had. On one fine morning, he was asked to open fire on an unarmed protester. He refused. He was posted off gun border where he resigned. He came back. It's a long story. So nobody in our family, I wanted to join the army. Again, uh, I could not join because my five brothers were commissioned officer in the Indian Army, the only family to give five children to India. So I wanted to be one of them, but I was rejected. So I came here. I was the youngest. I was spoiled. So I graduated from Chandigarh. So I told my mother, if I become bar at law, I will earn more money in India because I have a, you know, Rami Raja, bar at law, whatever. So please let me study. She agreed. I came. I sold my motorbike. I came and I found nothing. So you had a cultural shock. And, uh, you know, man is made of circumstances. So your circumstances changed. And then I worked for, as I, you know, I wanted to go back because it was a total, so I took a job as a car cleaner, and then I was very lucky to work in KFC. At least I was covered area in a not in the cold. And uh, so from there, I worked hard. But the guys did not know my hidden agenda was to make money and go. But I worked so hard, I left a good impression. And uh, they trained me in the business, and they taught me uh, so many things. So got made redundant. I went to Curry's, and I said to the guy that I have no idea about electronic. And the guy said, don't worry, after three months, you'll know more about electronics than the customer. So it's trial and error. You have to have this desire. I see Mr. Bogle, Aftar Bogle here from Bombay, film director who's made film. So the idea is that it is your uh, desire what you want to be, because it you got to. You know, a lot of people don't talk to each other or to talk to themselves. And if you sit down and talk to yourself, because all these people, Microsoft, Mark Zorro, they did not achieve everything in their college. Mm -hmm. they, this, everything they achieved, all the entrepreneur, all the success story you see, they did not achieve in the university or the college. They achieved outside, on their own, you know, working their own mind, thinking, which we never do. Unfortunately, I'm going to tell you one story. Uh, because is there anybody else with a question, or shall I tell you? Yeah, you go. Okay, too. very quickly. It's a very important question, because which I always say, who is holding us down? Nobody is holding us down. We hold ourselves down. Because there was a uh, office block and there was a sign. The man who was holding you down has died suddenly last night. His funeral will be on Wednesday. Those who want to pay respect, please. His body will be in the library, so you come. So. There was a big queue. Thank God, the man who who was holding us down has died finally. Yeah, who the hell was he? So let's go and see. So they queued to go to the library, and there was a coffin. As they opened the coffin, there was a mirror. He said, "Nobody holding you down except yourself." So people, people unfortunately hold themselves down, and they blame the other people. You know, there's a bad mechanic. And I'm very, very firm believer in English proverbs, because these proverbs are based on truth. If they were not based on truth, I wouldn't be repeating. My children will not repeat. Their children will not repeat. So they're based on truth, but people, we repeat them. You can't fool all the people all the time. You know, bad mechanic will all blame time. As you sow, so shall you reap. All these proverbs have profound meaning, but unfortunately, we just say it, but never Stop to dwell. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? So that's the story. Uh, Lovely. Yes, thank you. One more question. Good yeah. question from Stephen. Sorry. Uh, Stephen, the man. The man is really uh, my inspiration. <laughs> uh, you're my inspiration. Right? <laughs> Sir, no. I said it first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't fight with him. He's a boxer. <laughs> so I have to give in. Uh, the question I want to ask is. When you was first setting up uh, your business, how many hours did you put in with you? Were you going into the night? Right? Okay. The if you are with me on a motorway, you are driving exactly the same car as I'm driving. Yes? Same engine, same everything. But you want to overtake me. How will you overtake me? <laughs> Accelerator. <laughs> yes? Yeah. So when I came to this country, I knew that I have no old school boy network, no family well, nobody to give me any support. I'm an immigrant. I'm on my own. Yes? So I have to compensate. An Englishman is working six hours. I must work eight hours. If he's working eight hours, ten hours. That's how the Asian people on the whole, you know, compensated their own 
barriers or handicap, you know, language, the color, the food, you know, the food has become popular now. At one time, nobody could stand curry, now they can't get enough of it. <laughs> but, so there is, they, that was the reason that if an Englishman opened six, five days a week, we'll open six days, if you open six days, seven days. So if you want to overtake somebody, you cannot overtake by having a nice dress or a talking, you know, fancy talk. You actually have to get you the effort. You put more effort to the guy next door. Full stop. Okay, thank you. Thanks.